Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be using beam theory in order to derive a one-dimensional beam element. Looking at our beam, things are a little bit different than our bar element because this is not allowed to extend or contract. It's only going to be moving vertically and rotationally. Now, the nice part about this is that we can go ahead and define that our x1, the, the position of node 1, is going to be 0, and the position of node 2 is going to be the length of the element, because those will never change. However, we do have to think about vertical displacement. If we have <clears throat> our beam that moves up above the x-axis, which we can define here, we can define those displacements as v1, v2, and for the rotational displacements, we'll use phi1 and phi2. Now, for our rotational displacements, we're going to use the small angle approximation, which says that that angle is just going to be the same as the derivative of our vertical displacement with respect to x. So there are actually two approximations here, the first of which is we are neglecting shear stress. And the second is that this is a small angle. And that can be defined as our phi here being less than about 0.2 radians, and that works just fine. So with this, we have our displacements defined. This is everything we need to create a displacement vector. For the next piece, let's go ahead and look at what constitutes our force vector. In beam theory, we like to have our forces equal and opposite because our beam is going to be in static equilibrium. So that means that if we have a moment, on the left-hand side, that needs to be balanced with a moment on the right-hand side. And both those moments are going to be called M. For our shear forces, the same thing's going to happen. In this case, we're going to have an upwards shear force on the left and a downwards shear force on the right. Now, of course, when we're creating our beam element, we want everything to be positive, just because when we sum everything together, it makes our life easier. So that means that we're going to have a positive shear force on the left, v1, and a positive shear force on the right, v2. Likewise, both of our moments are going to be positive. So now we have everything defined that we need for our force vector. So the next step is going to be looking at beam theory itself. So beam theory says that our moment is going to be equal to Young's modulus multiplied by the moment of inertia multiplied by the second derivative of the vertical displacement with respect to x. It also says that the shear force is equal to the same EI multiplied by the third derivative. So what do we do with this? Well, we're going to look at these moments and apply them to the moments that we have for our force vector. <clears throat> our m1 is in the opposite direction of m, and so we're going to have negative m, which is equal to a negative EI multiplied by the second derivative, but the second derivative is going to be evaluated at x equals 0. Then we can do the same thing for m2, which in this case is a positive m, since both of those are in the same direction. So that's just going to be ei times the second derivative, this time evaluated x equals l. For v1, we have a positive v, both of those are in the same direction, so we get ei v cubed v dx cubed, evaluated at x equals 0. And then finally, v2 is a negative v, so we end up with a negative ei times the same. This is evaluated at x equals l. Now, in order to move forward, we need to do some work to define our v. And we're going to do this with the guess and check method or the assumed solution method, where we say that our displacement as a function of x is going to be equal to a cubic polynomial. Now, in reality, we could choose any function here. This is called a shape function, but the cubic polynomial is the standard solution here. And we need to go ahead and take the second derivative of this function. And that's pretty easy to do. We just end up with 6 times a1 times x plus 2 times a2. Then we're also going to be taking the third derivative, which is just equal to 6 times a1. So using these two expressions, we can go and evaluate the four components of our force vector. So m1 becomes a negative ei, 
multiplied by 2 times a2 because x is equal to 0. So this first term drops off. m2 becomes the same thing, except here this x is equal to l. And so we end up with a positive ei times 6a1l plus 2a2. Then for v1, we have a positive ei multiplied by 6a1, just plugging in this value. And then for v2, we just have a negative ei multiplied by 6a1. So we have everything in terms of our coefficients of this cubic polynomial. But what we really need is an equation that links our force vector to our displacement vector. So really, we need these a terms in terms of our v1 and our v1. The way we do that is just by evaluating what each of these values are going to be using our cubic polynomial. For instance, v1 is just our vertical displacement at 0. And so if we plug in 0 at all those points, we end up with a 4. v1 is the first derivative at 0. So we take a derivative, plug in zeros, and we end up with just a 3 left over. We do the same thing for v2, but it's a little bit more complicated. Here we have to actually plug in l's for each of these, and so we're left with four whole terms. And then for phi2, we take a derivative, and so in this case we only end up with three terms, 3a1l squared plus a2l plus a3. So from this, we have four equations, and we're going to solve for four unknowns. And in this case, our unknowns are going to be our a values. So once we solve the systems and equations, we're going to end up with our a values in terms of these four displacements. Now, we already have a3, a4. a1 is going to be 2 over l cubed multiplied by v1 minus v2 plus 1 over l squared times v1 plus v2. a2 is going to be a negative 3 over l squared times v1 minus v2 minus 1 over l times 2 times v1 plus v2. And this is a simple enough system of equations that you can probably get there just by substitution. Now, this a1 and a2 are what we need in order to plug things into our force vector components over here. So now we can go ahead and write our matrix. Our final system of equations is going to have our force vector for the left-hand side. And that will be equal to our stiffness matrix, which is going to be pre-multiplied in this case by EI over, we're taking the greatest common denominator out here just to make life a little easier for us. So that's going to be this L cubed. And that's going to make just writing the rest of the stiffness matrix easier. But all of that is going to be multiplied by our displacement vector, which is our v1, v1, v2, v2. And I really should write these bars just to make sure that you can see they're capitalized. So looking at our v1 equation to start, we're going to have our ei times 6 times a1. Well, a1 has this 2 over l cubed term. So we've already taken care of the l cubed. So we're going to have this 2 multiplied by 6, and that'll be multiplied by v1 to start with. So that'll be a 12 in the v1 place. So v1 times 12. We're going to have a negative 12 in the v2 place. And then we'll move to the v1 and v2. So here, we're missing one of our l's. And so we're going to have an l in the matrix. This just becomes 6l for both terms. Now for m1, we're looking at a2. We're going to have negative 2 times a2. All these are at least going to have an l in the term. So the negative 2 multiplied by a negative 3 gets us 6. We're going to have an extra l, and that's going to be multiplied by v1. So in the v1 place here, we're going to have 6 times l. In the v2 place, we're going to have a negative 6 times l. Now for v1, we're going to have an l squared. We have a negative times 2 multiplied by negative times 2, which gives us a positive 4. And so we end up with a positive 4L squared. The only difference between V1 and V2 is a factor of 2. And so this is going to be 2 times L squared. V2 is just the negative of V1. 
So all we have to do here is just copy the V1 row with a negative sign. So this will be negative 12, negative 6L, 12, negative 6L. This last one's a little more complicated, so we're just going to give you the answer for this one. But you can plug in A1 and A2 here and get the same thing. We end up with 6L, 2L squared, negative 6L, 4L squared. So at this point, we've completed our element stiffness matrix. This is everything we need to fully define the forces and displacements and link those to for a beam element. Now, what we'll be using this for in the coming videos is to go ahead and link multiple of these together in order to create a solution for a larger beam. So that is it for this video. I hope this was informative and I will catch you next time.